Welcome to Dig, the History Podcast. On May 23rd, 1861, just over one month after the first shots of the Civil War were fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina, three enslaved black men got into a rowboat and paddled across the James River from mainland Virginia to the Union-occupied Fortress Monroe. They had been taken from their homes and pressed into the service of the Confederate Army, forced to build artillery fortifications across the river from the Union lines. While they worked, building artillery placements for an army organized and deployed for the sole reason of protecting the institution of black chattel slavery, over their heads would have fluttered the banner of the 115th Virginia Militia, emblazoned with the words, give me liberty or give me death. If that irony wasn't enough for you, consider that the spit of land where they labored was also the same place where the first enslaved Africans arrived in the colonies all the way back in 1619. With the courage of these three men, America's peculiar institution began to die in the same place where it was born. Whether they knew it or not, the three young men, named Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend, had sparked the unraveling of the institution of slavery in the United States. If I had to guess, I would say that most of you listening likely already have a narrative about the end of slavery in your mind. It might start somewhere around 1859 with John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, or maybe in 1861 with the first shots of the Civil War, but I would venture that it probably hinges on one moment in political history, Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. I mean, after all, Lincoln freed the slaves, right? He's the great emancipator. But over the past 10 or 20 years, historians have been dismantling this foundational myth of American history. Don't get us wrong, Lincoln played a pivotal role in ending slavery, but his role was more cautious, more reluctant, and less charitable than we often believe. Instead, many historians argue it was enslaved people themselves who voted with their feet, taking it upon themselves to escape enslavement and demand freedom at the Union front lines. But freedom didn't come easily. Not only did enslaved people like Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend risk their lives when they escaped from the Confederate Army or their enslavers to seek a new life on the Union lines, they were not always met with open arms. Instead, they might face anything from impressment into the Union Army to a purgatory-like existence in vast, impromptu camps with poor sanitation, short supplies, and racist military guards. In today's installment of our do-over series, sort of do-over series, three do-overs and one new episode, (laughs) series that we don't know what it is, we are revisiting the complicated legal category of contraband, the term applied to enslaved people who fled to Union lines during the American Civil War. I am Sarah. And I'm Marissa. And we are your historians for this episode of Dick. When the Civil War began in 1861, slavery was the problem at its very heart. If that statement is surprising or upsetting to you, you need to go do some more reading. And I am more than happy to give you those reading recommendations, but I'm not going to build that case right here and now. We don't have time. Uh, But while slavery was the driving cause of the war, that does not mean that every actor in the Civil War had the same or similar feelings about the issue of slavery. One of the things that some people believe about the Civil War is that Abraham Lincoln hated slavery and was elected to put it to an end. But that's really not accurate at all. When Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated in March of 1861, and I should say inaugurations used to take place in March, now of course they take place in January, he made it very clear in his first inaugural address that he was not going to be an abolitionist president. Within the first few lines, Lincoln declared that he had, quote, no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. 
Lincoln explained that he had been elected to uphold the Constitution. And since slavery was protected by the Constitution and executive power did not give him the ability to change that, it was his job to govern the nation as it was. He summed it up this way, quote, one section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended, while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended. This is the only substantial dispute. The Fugitive Slave Clause of the Constitution and the law for the suppression of the foreign slave trade are each as well enforced, perhaps, as any law can ever be in a community where the moral sense of the people imperfectly supports the law itself. The great body of people abide by the dry legal obligation in both cases and a few break over in each. This, I think, cannot be perfectly cured, and it would be worse in both cases after the separation of the sections than before. The foreign slave trade now imperfectly suppressed would be ultimately revived without restriction in one section, while fugitive slaves now only partially surrendered would not be surrendered at all by the other. So it's going to have to be one or the other. Right, yeah. What's notable about the first inaugural address is that he's speaking not to the nation as a whole, like in most inaugural speeches, but directly to the South, particularly because by that march, several states, South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Texas, had already seceded. And what Lincoln's trying to do in this speech is to convince the South that he's not going to abolish slavery. He's saying the real argument is over the extension of slavery into the territories, not over whether to abolish slavery as it exists in the South. Historian Alan Galzo, among others, have pointed out that Lincoln was being very lawyerly, right? He never said he would abolish slavery, but he also didn't defend the morality of slavery. And he parsed his words in some places about slavery and the Constitution in ways that pissed off Southerners and Northern abolitionists. And we know that Lincoln will eventually take major steps to end slavery in the United States. But the key takeaway here in March 1861 is that Lincoln did not blaze into office chomping at the bit to end slavery. The other thing that Lincoln made clear in the first inaugural was that if there was going to be a war, Southerners were going to have to be the aggressors. Just before he ends the speech, he says this, quote, In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being of yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it, end quote. This phrase really shows Lincoln's ability to construct persuasive and clever arguments. By saying that the South must be the aggressors, he understood that it meant the South would have to take the blame for starting a war. At the same time, though, Lincoln understood that it meant that the North would fight a war that could look as though it was completely motivated by the desire simply to reunite the broken union, not by a zealous desire to destroy the institution of slavery. It's all about appearances, right? Mm -hmm. It's passive aggression. <clears throat> it is a little passive aggressive. But while Lincoln was careful not to make the war, or at least at that point, the potential war, about slavery, others were determined to make sure that slavery took center stage. An example of this that I use with my students is two union marching songs. And, you know, there were tons of marching songs, and many of them were just fun or funny songs to sing. But two in particular stand out to me as examples of how no matter how much Lincoln tried to control the image of the union's motivations during the war, slavery remained at its center. It always makes its way back to the center of, of this whole conflict. And side note, just because I think it's funny... Um, both of these songs are sung to the same tune, <laughs> which is interesting. The first song is John Brown's Body, which talks about the soul of John Brown marching on, just as the Union Army marched onward into battle. There are different versions of the song, but the final stanza of, of the, the version I usually use goes like this. He captured Harper's Ferry with his 19 men so true. He frightened old Virginia till she trembled through and true. They hung him for a traitor, they themselves the traitor crew. But his soul goes marching on. And the chorus goes, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, his soul goes marching on. The second song is probably the most famous, and it's still often sung in churches or at patriotic gatherings. It's, it's sung at my church on Memorial Day weekend, and that's the Battle Hymn of the Republic. This song, written by Julia Ward Howe, is about how the Union Army marches forward to enact God's truth. 
Not just any truth, but the truth that slavery must end. And the song ends with one of, I think, one of the most moving bits of poetry written about this war. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free, while God is marching on. I I find these two songs really, really powerful, to the point where um, when I I have this activity that I do in class and I pass out, um, you know printouts of the lyrics and we go through them together and try to kind of analyze them and try to think about, you know, what would soldiers have been thinking about when they sang these songs? What did they represent? And sometimes, especially as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. I actually Mm -hmm. get yeah, like weirdly verklempt. Yeah. And I know that it doesn't represent the entire truth about how people felt about slavery. Yeah. Not every Union soldier felt like they were going to die to make men free. But there's something really powerful about that. There's, you know, it, it's still yeah, just, it, I find it moving. You have to think that even soldiers who joined to preserve the Union, that even those people would have sung this song. Yeah. And then perhaps yeah. at some point actually kind of like had an believed impact. in right. that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, got, it, it was part of the ethos, right? And I just find it an incredibly powerful phrase. Although this time when I read it, the, the, what was it that stood out to me? In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea. What? I don't know. It's very <laughs> like, pretty. Was there lilies there? I don't know. I'm... All of this, the inaugural address and the songs, is just to show that while we know that slavery was the core cause and problem of the war, not everyone at the time agreed that that was what the war was about as it was happening, Right. Well, Lincoln, especially early in the war, wanted to play his hand close to the vest in terms of his plans for slavery, instead arguing that the sole purpose of the Union's fight was to preserve the Union, that doesn't mean that others agreed with that assessment. And those who did the most to ensure that the war was centered on the issue of slavery and freedom weren't the Union soldiers singing John Brown while on the march or the politicians parsing words in the capitals, but enslaved people themselves. From the moment the first men in Union blue appeared in slaveholding states, enslaved Slave people knew that this war represented their opportunity to seize freedom. When Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend rowed across the James River to Fortress Monroe, they were forcing a Union army, and by extension, Abraham Lincoln, to address slavery directly. They're forcing their hand, right? Right. So it was enslaved people themselves more than any marching song that made the war a war to destroy the institution of slavery. So let's come back to that moment when they arrived at the fort on the coast of Virginia. The next morning after they arrived, they were brought before the commander of the fort, Benjamin Butler. Now, Butler was an odd duck. He had absolutely no military background, but saw service in the military as a way of potentially advancing a political career, so he lobbied hard for a commission in the Union Army. John William DeForest, an officer who served under Butler later in the war, recalled that, quote, on the whole, he seems less like a major general than like a politician who was coaxing for votes. Butler liked to stir things up, and because of that, he presided over some of the more dramatic moments of the war and several more after the war. Um, You may recall from our episode on Victoria Woodhull that Ben Butler was the politician who got permission for Victoria Woodhull to give that floor speech to Congress. And it's my theory, and I think it's a good one, (laughs) that Victoria Woodhull got him to do that by sleeping with him. Right. Um, And this is even more interesting considering that Ben Butler looked sort of like an abused bulldog. Like, (laughs) he was... He was a very unattractive man. Oh, poor Ben Butler. He had these, like, long jowls. (laughs) Another critical thing to know about Ben Butler is that he was not an abolitionist. He was a Democrat, a party that owed much of its success to the white working classes that thought the abolitionists were dangerous zealots bent on race amalgamation. He was a doe-faced Democrat. He was. So when these three men came before him, he wasn't naturally inclined to be in their favor. But at the same time, he was presiding at a fort over a large number of new Union recruits, many of whom were from Massachusetts, 
um, who were abolitionists or the sons of abolitionists. If Butler dismissed the young enslaved men back to their captors, it was likely that his soldiers would not be very happy with their new commander. Like the ambitious politician that he was, Butler read the room, so to speak. Butler asked the young men a bunch of questions, trying to figure out the best path forward. Where were they from? Who were their masters? What work had they been doing? Ultimately, he sent them away without any indication of his position. Just a few minutes later, an adjutant came to the general to say that a Virginian under a flag of truce had come to the fort to speak to him. This man, it turned out, was Major John Baytop Carey of the 115th Virginia, the unit that had been holding the three enslaved men that, that they had escaped from. Mm-hmm. Butler went out and rode out to meet Carey, and they had a conversation on horseback. I'm just going to read a description of the conversation that they had. So um, it was reconstructed by historian Adam Goodhart, and just so you know, it includes language that we wouldn't use today. So we're not using these words. <clears throat> this is a quotation. Right, right, right. I'll play John Baytop Carey, and then and I and get to be Sarah. Ben Butler. Right, you can be Ben Butler, the bulldog. <laughs> so, quote: I am informed that three Negroes belonging to Colonel Mallory have escaped within your lines. I'm Colonel Mallory's agent and have charge of his property. What do you mean to do with these Negroes? Uh, I intend to hold them. Do you mean then to set aside your constitutional obligation to return them? And I'm going to be the narrator here for a second. Even the dour butler must have found it hard to suppress a smile. This was, of course, a question that he had expected. And he prepared what he thought was a fairly clever answer. I mean to take Virginia at her word. I am under no constitutional obligations to a foreign country, which Virginia now claims to be. (laughs) Zinger. Whoa. But you say we cannot secede. And so you cannot consistently detain the Negroes. But you say you have seceded, so you cannot consistently claim them. I shall hold these Negroes as contraband of war, since they are engaged in the construction of your battery and are claimed as your property. (laughs) Zing. Good one. Okay, go ahead. We'll explain all that banter about seceding or not seceding soon. That that gets a little complicated, so we're going to set that aside for just one second to tell the rest of the story. The next day, Butler sent a note to Washington to update the War Department of the decision he had come to regarding the three men. But even before Lincoln and his cabinet could respond, Butler was faced with the immediate consequences of his decision. He had talked to Carey on a Friday. By Sunday morning, eight more enslaved men appeared at the fort's gates. By Monday, that eight was followed by 47 more. And this time, it wasn't just young men, but families, elderly people, and mothers with small children. According to Adam Goodhart, by Wednesday, one Massachusetts soldier wrote home that, quote, slaves are brought in here hourly. Later, in July 1861, Butler would elaborate on his decision in a letter to Secretary of War Simon Cameron. Butler explained that initially, it seemed very clear that the men working in the name of the Confederate Army could easily be considered contraband since they were being, quote, used in the aid of the rebellion, just as a ship or a cannon might be. But it became more complicated when he realized that women, children, and elderly people were also flocking to the perceived safety of the fort. They couldn't be considered contraband in quite the same sense. And if they were confiscated as property, it would mean that the Union Army believed that they really were property. Unless the act of escaping and running to Union lines, where slavery was not recognized, meant that they had set themselves free. Right? This is like a super complicated thing. Butler asked Cameron, quote, have they not become thereupon men, women, and children, no longer under ownership of any kind, the fearful relics of fugitive masters? Have they not by their master's acts in the state of war assumed the condition which we hold to be the normal one of those made in God's image? Is not every constitutional, legal, and moral requirement as well to the runaway master as their relinquished slaves thus answered? I confess that my own mind is compelled by this reasoning to look upon them as men and women, if not freeborn, yet free, manumitted, set forth from the hand that held them never to be reclaimed. Believing that this was the case, Butler explained that it was his duty as a, quote, humane man to shelter even women and children who did not directly support the Confederate cause. So they can, they want 
their cake and eat it too. Who Butler? Yeah. The so they want they're they're gonna they're gonna consider them property so they can take them as contraband. But the ones that aren't technically property, they're going they're to say, well, those ones aren't property. property. Exactly. <laughs> right? right. So like, but either way, it benefits the union yeah. cause. Butler right? realizes he's in like a really complicated legal position mm-hmm. and that Cameron's not going to like it. So mm-hmm. he's like trying to figure out all these different ways that he right. can make his argument. Yeah. 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 Legal machination. So um, Butler was concerned that his reasoning wouldn't be enough because not long before Brigadier General Irvin McDowell, the general in charge of the Army of Northeastern Virginia, had issued an order declaring that runaways who came to the Union lines should be turned away. Did this just apply to the Army of Northeastern Virginia? Did it mean that slaves would be treated as fugitive slaves, which constitutionally needed to be returned to their masters? So how were military commanders supposed to determine a refugee's status? If the Secretary of War demanded that McDowell's order be followed, Butler said he would comply. But if he was given the ability to act independently as an officer, he would follow his own reasoning. He wrote, quote, in a loyal state, I would put down a servile insurrection in a state of rebellion. I would confiscate that which was used to oppose my arms and take all that property which constituted the wealth of that state and furnish the means by which the war is prosecuted. Besides being the cause of the war, and if in so doing, it should be objected that human beings were brought to the free enjoyment of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, such objection might not require much consideration, end quote. He's saying, I would confiscate those who we can literally consider contraband of war, those who oppose my arms, but also saying, and take all that property which constitutes the wealth of that state. He's Mm -hmm. considering that contraband as well, because it's contributing to the wealth of the the cause, right? Right, and even if they're not literally fighting the war for them, this is a true. This is a really sticky part of this decision. Makes sense to me, though. Whether Butler realized it or not, he had forced Secretary of War Cameron and the entire Lincoln administration into a tight spot. Cameron wrote back on August 8th that he believed eventually Congress would settle the question and that in the meantime, Butler would could continue to accept runaways. But Butler was also firmly instructed to report back to Washington often to ensure that his soldiers did not encourage enslaved people to leave, quote, the lawful service of their masters, end quote, and that he, Butler, would never prevent the, quote, voluntary return of any fugitive slave to the service from which he may have escaped. As Marissa mentioned a moment ago, and as Cameron was getting to at the end of his letter, Butler had created a constitutional problem. This gets a little complicated to explain, so bear with us. The Constitution includes a clause in Article 4, Section 2, known as the Fugitive Slave Clause. The clause reads like this, quote, No person held in service or labor in one state, under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall, in consequence of any law or regulation therein, be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. That's why... Under the Constitution, Ben Butler should have returned those enslaved men to their masters when they came calling. But Sarah, you might be saying, that doesn't make any sense because by the time the three young men arrived at Fortress Monroe, Virginia had seceded and was adding itself to the new Confederate States of America. You're not wrong, (laughs) but you're also not totally right. This is where it gets a little tricky. I think I've said that eight times. I think this whole thing is just tricky. Um, And it's actually where we need to take a step back and look again at Lincoln's first inaugural. In the inaugural address, Lincoln vows to uphold and enforce the Constitution, which includes the Fugitive Slave Clause. As he states right from the beginning, quote, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. But how does that work when several states have just left the Union? Well, (laughs) like he's saying this even though they have already left. Correct. Right. So um, Lincoln would say they didn't leave the Union because you can't leave the Union. For a major chunk of the address, Lincoln actually turns into a little bit of a constitutional law professor to explain how secession is both illegal and impossible. This comes down to a fundamental disagreement between Lincoln and most Southerners on what the United States actually is or are. 
I'm just kidding. That's very clever. (laughs) Such an ass. So anyway, (laughs) I guess I'm nerdy and I like legal (laughs) things. I don't know. Um, Many Southern politicians believe that the United States was actually a confederation of states, that the states were all sort of independent actors that all came together to establish a social compact to have a federal government. And I want to add, that's one of the reasons why we call them states instead of provinces, because they are states, because they have their own governments. Right, because and of the concept of federalism. Exactly, and, and exactly. So, power, right. you know, most other kind of republics, they have provinces or mm-hmm. counties or whatever, mm-hmm. it's right? It's a little different. And when the federal government overstepped, they believed that states had a kind of sovereignty to just opt out. Just be like, no thanks, right? And this is how South Carolina almost seceded in 1833 during the nullification crisis. They just said that they didn't like a federal law. It was the tariff of 1828, Mm -hmm. I think, right? Tariff of abominations. Tariff of abominations. (laughs) And they said they had the power to nullify it and just say, yeah, no thanks, right? Um, And they threatened to take their marbles and go home if the federal government didn't let them. This was summarized by South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun, who argued that the U.S. government is federal in contradistinction to a national government, referring to the concept of federalism or the sharing of power between state and federal governments. I want to also interject for one second because I'm a dork about this, (laughs) but I recently found out uh, when I was writing a lecture about this for my class that, that John C. Calhoun attempted to kind of like cajole Jackson into allowing them to nullify the tariff Uh by inviting him to Jefferson's birthday party at one of his old houses. And so there was a celebration. It was like Uh a Jefferson Day, like a birthday or whatever, Uh because it had only been... Dead for a handful of years. Yeah. Yeah. And so they went there, and then John C. Calhoun mentioned, like, hey, nullification, like, because he thought that Jackson, because Jefferson was so, like, into mm-hmm. states' rights mm-hmm. or whatever. Yes, so yeah, he yeah. thought that, and Jackson kind of was too. So he's like, yeah. oh, like, he's going to be like, yeah, sure. Right. And then Jackson got up and was like, we cannot let this union fall or something. And then Calhoun was like, oh. <laughs> And I just think it's so funny to think that he, like, orchestrated this whole party, like, specifically. Right, like, I'm going to woo Jackson, yeah. Right, and Jackson was just, like, F you. God, John C. Calhoun was a wackadoodle. He really was. But Lincoln argued that Calhoun and his southern brethren had it all wrong. Now, Calhoun's dead (laughs) at this point. He's, like, he's not really arguing with Calhoun. He's arguing with Calhoun's, like, you know, uh, the people who inherited his vision. Mm -hmm. Lincoln argues the states didn't create the union. The union created the states. After all, he says, quote, the union is much older than the Constitution, which is, you know, accurate, and was formed all the way back in 1774, solidified in the Declaration of Independence in 1776, and further shaped by the first governing document, the Articles of Confederation. Even more, he says, in, quote, 1787, one of the declared objects for ordaining and establishing the Constitution was to form a more perfect union. In other words, the union existed long before the states did, and therefore states don't have the right or the ability to revert to a previous state of independence. That previous form would have been as a colony, not as a state. The one exception to this might be Texas, which was because independent. Texas was right. a republic before. Right. So I don't know if Lincoln thought about I don't know how that played into it at all, but yeah. I just thought that that was really interesting. Anyway, mm-hmm. um, the argument that Lincoln is building here is that secession is not a thing. You can't secede. You can say that you secede, but the Constitution doesn't include an escape clause. So actually, you remain as you always were in terms of your relation with the federal government. You're not a foreign country. For instance, Lincoln says that the mail, which is a federally controlled government service outlined in the Constitution, will still be delivered. I mean, imagine that. Lincoln's like, we're still going to deliver your mail. (laughs) Right? Like, you're going to try to kill us, but we're still going to give you your letters. It's crazy. (laughs) And he goes on to say that the legal recourse for being angry about government policy is to amend the Constitution. But that secession, if it were possible, was essentially the essence of anarchy. Yeah, so they're just like rogue states. They're not a foreign country. Right. They're like misbehaving, 
they shouldn't, you know, be acting like such fools, but they right. didn't secede. They're and the weird thing is, country. that's what that's how like the U.S. Mexican War started because Mexico still considered Texas to be part of Mexico, right. mm-hmm. and Texas was like, "Oh no, we're a foreign country," and Mexico was like, "Yeah, no, whatever, you're actually still Mexico." Right. So then when we annexed Texas, Mexico was like, "What the? F-? That's actually Mexico," and you know what I mean? Yeah, it's all. It's all, you know, words and like it's all words. <laughs> it's all just words. So, um, while Butler seems to indicate in his letter to Cameron that he knows that this was a tricky legal situation, it actually had much larger implications than he probably suspected. By refusing to return fleeing slaves, he was actually acting in conflict with the United States Constitution. If Virginia had never actually seceded, then the Fugitive Slave Clause was still good law, and Butler should have returned the enslaved men, just like they were delivering the mail, right? Right, exactly. By refusing to return those enslaved men, Butler was playing into Confederate talking points that Lincoln was a sneaky, aggressive zealot bent on abolishing slavery. Butler had also undermined the argument Lincoln made in the first inaugural that he was going to act as though the southern states had never seceded and continue to enforce the law of the land. After all, Butler is an agent of the U.S. government, effectively seizing private property without solid legal footing. Moreover, it wasn't clear what this meant outside of Fortress Monroe. Was this the official stance of the United States government? What should other commanders do? As we see from Butler's confusion over McDowell's order to his army, different officials were acting independently and sometimes issuing clashing orders. Things were kind of a mess. Yeah, that sums up 1861. Like, things were just a mess. The issue was sort of addressed, as Cameron suggested, uh, by Congress in the form of the Confiscation Act of 1861. We're going to refer to this as the first Confiscation Act because there were two laws with the same name, which I don't know why they do. And it's really annoying. We shouldn't do that. It's kind of like the Treaty of Paris. Uh Like, sign your treaty somewhere else. Right. Because I can't keep that straight. Uh Um, But we'll come to the second Confiscation Act soon. This law, the first Confiscation Act, was signed into law by Lincoln on August 6th, 1861. So it was in its first days when Cameron wrote back to Butler, and it would have addressed at least some of Butler's concerns. The law allowed for the confiscation of any property being used to support the Confederate cause as contraband of war. This was on solid legal ground, with long precedence in European war traditions and solidified in the fairly recent 1856 Declaration of Paris, which had been, um, which was kind of part of the um, negotiations at the end of the Crimean War. So it it had backing in international war theory and law, I should say, not Mm -hmm. necessarily in the U.S., But from the beginning, the intention of the law, as influenced by radical Republican Senator Lyman Trumbull, was to include enslaved people as contraband of war under this um, category of property. This was pretty transparent, and even as it was debated in Congress, it sparked the same kind of accusations of abolitionism that Butler's actions had, the very accusations that Lincoln was trying to avoid. Lincoln was very reluctant to sign the bill, largely because he believed that it would never pass constitutional scrutiny. There was shaky legal ground at best for arguing that enslaved persons were contraband of war, especially women and children, for the you know reasons that you suggested earlier, because they're not being used actively in the... Um, the, the no, they're In support though, of the war. Because... Enslaved <clears throat> women were, like, the basis for yes. slavery after the end of the slave trade, so f*** that. You're absolutely correct, <laughs> and it will come back around to that. But okay. under this definition, it's only property used in the support, the active support of the war. So they're thinking ditch diggers, fortification builders, people who are working as manservants in the army. They're thinking soldiers or slaves being used to support the war okay. in that very specific way. It Doing wasn't war work. Exactly. Okay. It wasn't that Lincoln didn't believe that there was, as Alan Gelzo phrases it, a humanitarian appeal to the Confiscation Act. But Lincoln believed that any long term effort towards legally sound emancipation would be damaged by such bold and ill founded projects. 
This is where Lincoln can be such a tricky, complicated historical figure. He wasn't pro-slavery. He wasn't even ambivalent, really, when it came to slavery. But he did think that any effort to end slavery had to be done slowly, deliberately, and with very strong legal grounding, lest it all crumble and allow slavery to become even more entrenched than before. But that meant that when enslaved people were arriving at the very gates of freedom by voting with their feet and going to the Union lines, Lincoln wasn't tripping over himself to accommodate them, which isn't great, right? However reluctantly, though, Lincoln did sign the bill and it became law in the late summer of 1861. Things actually got even more confusing shortly after Cameron's early August letter back to Butler. So in early July... Lincoln had commissioned the famous Western adventurer and sometime politician John C. Fremont to head up the Department of the West, the military district that covered everything from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. So basically, like, the Louisiana Purchase. Sure. You well, you're just calling it that's what the it, West. Okay, fine. I'm just saying. That's what it's called, the Department of the West. I know. No, I know. I No, it's fine. <laughs> It's my, I'm just, I'm, my quibble is with them, not with you, okay? <laughs> Primarily, Fremont's real job was making sure that slaveholding Missouri did not join the Confederacy, so he set up his headquarters in St. Louis. By the time he arrived, though, Missouri was in utter chaos as the state devolved into pro-Union and pro-Confederate factions. We've covered some of this before, so take a listen to our Civil War Guerrillas episode um, that goes into the border ruffians and all that stuff, right? It's a really complicated story. Yeah, it really is. So Fremont thought the best way to establish his control was by declaring martial law in St. Louis when he arrived in mid-August 1861 over the complaints of the Unionist government officials already in the city. Just over a week later, Fremont took things a step further by declaring martial law across the entire state of Missouri. What's more, he issued an order influenced by the very newly signed Confiscation Act that said that, quote, the property real and personal of all persons who shall take up arms against the United States or who shall be directly proven to have taken an active part with their enemies in the field is declared to be confiscated to the public use and their slaves, if any they have, are hereby declared free men, end quote. For most of that order, Fremont was more or less on solid ground. After all, the Confiscation Act allowed the United States government to seize contraband property, which included enslaved people. He was pushing things a bit, though. He was declaring this power through the imposition of martial law, which was concerning and a bit tyrannical, and expanded the criteria by which property could be considered, quote, contraband. In other words, you know, not just property that was used in the continuation of the Confederate cause, but personal property and even the personal property of those who had even a tenuous connection to the cause. Alan Gelzo, for instance, you know, makes the example of, you know, a Confederate soldier's wife's piano could be considered contraband because she was married to a Confederate soldier, right? It was the last phrase, though, that really took things to a new level. Butler's Fortress Monroe decision and the Confiscation Act both allowed for the seizure of contraband goods, but never touched the question of whether enslaved people who were considered contraband were free. Emancipating enslaved people was taking the legal tap dance about war powers over enemy property to a completely different place. Did the federal government have the power to just free slaves? This was another problem for Lincoln. Again, it's not that Lincoln loved the idea of slavery or that he wanted to protect it. But during the chaotic, confusing first months of the war, Lincoln's first priority was not freedom. It was actually keeping the border states from seceding and joining the Confederacy. So the border states were Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, Delaware, um, eventually also Kansas, which became a state in 61, and West Virginia, which became a state in 62. Can I just interject to say... This is literally my job. Like, I'm, I am a Civil War historian. Yeah. And every single time I say anything about border states, I have to Google it because I cannot remember which ones were the border states. I thought you were going <laughs> to yell at me. No. I I just, it's I, embarrassing to me that I'm always like, wait, Kentucky? Yeah, Kentucky. Um, I knew Kentucky, Missouri, and Kansas, but I, and I would have guessed Maryland, I guess, because mm-hmm. Maryland, but like, I wouldn't have guessed Delaware. Delaware is a little weird state. It's just a little, a little tiny L. I don't that's know in anything about Delaware. Maryland. I don't want to. Okay, so border states, right? <laughs> yeah. So Sarah needs to Google them every time. 
I'm a dum dum. She's a dum dum. So each of these states were slaveholding. Lincoln and his administration were extremely sensitive to the fact that any effort on their part to end slavery to any degree would be interpreted by the border states as an act of aggression and very likely drive them into the arms of the slavery-obsessed Confederacy. Fremont's very job in the Department of the West had been to keep Missouri from joining the Confederacy, but here he was making a decision that put that in jeopardy, and it wasn't just Missouri that was affected by Fremont's act. Joshua Speed, Lincoln's former law partner and friend, wrote to the president to explain how the act was going to be interpreted in Kentucky, his home state. Quote, I have just seen Fremont's proclamation. It will hurt us in Kentucky. The war should be waged upon high points and no state law can be interfered with. Our constitution and our laws both prohibit the emancipation of slaves among us, even in small numbers. If a military commander can turn them loose by the thousand by a mere proclamation, it will be a most difficult matter to get our people to submit to it, end quote. Submit to it meaning submit to the constitution. To the to this new pro- this new oh policy. to the new yeah. policy okay. Speed also pointed to another fear that those in border states might have that this order would lead to huge numbers of enslaved people fleeing their homes and acting as if they were free, which raised the specter of slave rebellion to many paranoid Southerners. Um, Speed wrote, quote, all of us who live in the slave states, whether union or loyal, have great fear of insurrection. Will not such a proclamation read by the slaves incline them to assert their freedom? End quote. And that sounds like kind of like what happened in Jamaica with those with the Maroon Wars. Mm-hmm. And I, like that sounds seems like kind of what <clears throat> they're thinking about. Yeah. Like, like, it's not exactly a slave insurrection. It's right that these slave communities would right, yeah. cause and, a bigger. And thing. it's also this kind of weird, like. If you're going to free these people under these circumstances, you're going to, everybody else is just going to free themselves. Like, you can't be like, those slaves are free over there because it's going to mean that these people over here are going to say, well, I'm free too. Right. And it's, mm-hmm. it's going to, it's just going to be de- so even devolve into chaos. So even the ones it doesn't apply to are going to argue it applies right. to them and that's going to be a whole thing. Yeah. yeah. You, you can't just free some of them. You're going to have to free everybody. And that's actually what Lincoln is, is trying to figure out how he can do. Right. <clears throat> Historian James McPherson has described Lincoln as an iron fist in a velvet glove, and his handling of Fremont is a good example of that. Ever the diplomat, Lincoln wrote to Fremont in early September asking him not to rescind the order, but to modify, or at least to not enforce its more, its more radical aspects. Fremont wrote back, more or less telling Lincoln he would do no such thing. <laughs> Can you imagine? No, No. not gonna. This rubbed Lincoln the wrong way, and he wrote back, and this time, more pointedly, directed Fremont to modify the order. In addition, uh, Lincoln sent two of his allies, cabinet member Montgomery Blair and quartermaster general Montgomery Miggs, which, like, side note, how bizarre is it that that he was like, I'll take these two people named Montgomery. Montgomery. (laughs) Like, how often do you run into people named Montgomery? I mean, we had one in my episode, in the Frankenstein episode. We did? Yeah, the Earl who had the beating heart that you could see on the outside. Oh, that's right. Oh, weird. This is a lot of Montgomery's. <laughs> um, anyway, he sends the Montgomery's to Missouri to report back on Fremont's conduct, basically to kind of inspect how things are going there on the ground. Their report was not great. In fact, Montgomery Blair reported that Fremont, quote, seems stupefied and almost unconscious and is doing absolutely nothing. Fremont saw where this was going, and he tried to use his political connections to keep him in his post. Uh, his his wife was the daughter of a very powerful politician named Thomas Hart Benton. So he tries to, like, pull those strings. But by late October, Lincoln dismissed Fremont from his post. Anti-slavery politicians and activists were not happy about Fremont's dismissal. While Fremont was by no means an abolitionist hero, he's actually a, a Democrat, His action, like Butler's, also a Democrat, seemed like the kind of bold, decisive blow against the slave power that the nation needed. But Lincoln was determined to move carefully and deliberately on the issue, even if it meant angering members of his own party. 
Lincoln's position here, from a modern perspective, doesn't look great. There's absolutely an argument for saying that immediate, bold emancipation, in whatever ways possible, would have been better than biding one's time for the right moment. But just to offer a little perspective on Lincoln's position, we want to quote directly this summary from Alan Gelzo, and you by no means need to agree with it. So, Gelzo explains that all these efforts were contingent on a state of war. Um, they had no permanence, and they did nothing to affect the legality of slavery as an institution. Quote, which is why Lincoln scarcely ever mentioned contrabands, was skeptical about the Confiscation Act, and modified Fremont's proclamation. None of them had any promise that they would stick. And if any of them failed to survive a court challenge, the prospect for all future emancipation would be set back, just as Taney's decision in Dred Scott had set back the struggle to keep slavery out of the territories. And this was before any consideration of the possible political debris these schemes would shake out in the border states or in Congress. In the wake of the Bull Run, uh, recalled James Blaine, quote, the military situation was so discouraging that in the president's view, it would have been wiser for Congress to refrain from enacting laws which, without success in the field, would be rendered unnecessary, end quote. So that makes a lot of sense that, like, it's, mm-hmm. if it, if they weren't, if they didn't stand up to legal scrutiny in a court battle, then that precedent would make emancipation even, even less possible. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, th- I think it makes sense. Uh-huh. It's, it's a hard thing to swallow now uh-huh. because we want immediate and unequivocal emancipation in right. 1776, right? Like any amount of time was too long and any equivocating seems wrong. It, it is wrong. It's human bondage. Uh-huh. But Lincoln really was thinking about this in a lawyerly way. Like, if we if we do this in this rash way, in this particular thing under martial law, and it gets knocked down in the courts, it's f***. Yeah. Like, it's over. It will never That kind never of reminds end. me of the civil yeah. rights movement. Like, mm-hmm. this idea, like, th- it was very well planned. Mm-hmm. People who understood the American legal system and understood how to... Right. Like, how demonstrations, you know, um, could, or how um, certain actions could kind of travel up to the Supreme Court and actually change yes. things. Like, it wasn't haphazard. It. Right. right. Yeah. And Lincoln is saying this, what Butler is doing and what Fremont is doing, it's just, it's haphazard. It's, it's, you know, people making decisions by the seat of their pants and he has a vision. Mm-hmm. Right. And Lincoln did have his own plans for ending slavery while keeping the border states in the Union. For instance, he had an idea about a compensation scheme that would reimburse slave owners for their lost property. That that would shift and change over the course of the war. And as we all know, or should know, Lincoln eventually moved in September 1862, a year after all these debacles we've talked about so far, to issue the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, which used the, you know, success, to be very generous, of Antietam to sell the idea of emancipating slavery in the afterglow of a military victory. But we're running low on time, and it would be a dereliction of our mission as DIG to use this whole episode to discuss the political machinations of several powerful white dudes. So I want to shift our perspective here a little bit. At the heart of the issue of contraband wasn't legal definitions or political decision making, but enslaved people making difficult, often life-threatening, even life-ending decisions. After all, the people who forced slavery into the fore in the first year of the war weren't really Ben Butler and John C. Fremont, but the three men who escaped from bondage in Virginia and sought freedom at Fortress Monroe. As we already mentioned, within days of those men's arrival at the fort, dozens more enslaved people arrived seeking refuge. By the end of 1865, Fortress Monroe was home to what had become known as the Grand Contraband Camp, home to some 10,000 refugees of slavery. Camps like the Grand Contraband Camp pop up everywhere that the Union Army goes. Refugees tagged along even when the Army was on the march. According to historian Amy Morrell Taylor, refugees established nearly 300 camps across the South from coastal Virginia to Kansas. But just because refugees gathered near Union encampments, forts, and lines does not mean that they were safe or comfortable. Camps were often overcrowded, suffered from poor sanitation, shelter was sometimes scarce, and supplies were always low. Enslaved people often fled bondage with nothing but the clothes they had on their backs, which typically wasn't much. 
John Eaton, a Union officer who oversaw the Union response to the refugees in the Mississippi River Valley, wrote in 1864 that, quote, You saw them, of both sexes, of all ages, in every stage of health, disease, and decrepitude, often nearly naked, their flesh torn and escaping, end quote. A woman named Maria Mann, who worked as a teacher of freed people, wrote in 1863 that refugees, quote, arrived in Union camp with their swellings, open sores, and eaten up with vermin. Their mortality is greatly increased. End quote. Decades after emancipation, one former refugee recounted her experience with the flight to freedom. Quote, we was freed and went to a place that was full of people. We had to stay in a church with about 20 other people, and two of the babies died there on account of exposure. Two of my aunts died, too, on account of exposure then. End quote. Amy Morrell Taylor, in her fantastic and multi-award-winning new book, Embattled Freedom, tells the story of Emma and Edward Whitehurst, who escaped enslavement in Virginia and fled to Ben Butler's federal troops in northern Virginia. They gathered on a plantation that Butler's troops had seized near Newport News. When they arrived, they were inspected to determine to what extent they could perform manual labor. As much as the Union Army and federal government officials were concerned that refugees would be little more than a drag on the Army's resources, they were more than happy to benefit from their manual labor, while, of course, you know, denying that labor to their enemies. Edward was pressed into labor as a hospital steward and grave digger, while Emma likely did laundry or cooked for the troops and other refugees. But within a few weeks, they experienced another danger of seeking refuge with the Union Army, the constant threat of re-enslavement by the encroaching Confederate Army. In late July, Irvin McDowell and his Union forces were beaten badly by Confederate forces led by PGT Beauregard, Pierre Gustave Dutin Beauregard, and Joe Johnston. While that battle, this is the Battle of First Manassas or First Bull Run, Uh, was about 100 miles away from their location in Newport News, the the Whitehurst's location. The defeat threw the Union Army into disarray and broke up Butler's forces on the coast, leaving the refugees vulnerable. In an effort to capitalize on the Union Army's quick evacuation of the coast and to recoup the lost property and slaves under Union protection in the area, Confederate John B. Magruder set out to march up the coast. Magruder gave those in his command the following orders, quote, If the Negroes in the Back River region and on the James River can be surprised and captured at night or by day by small parties of troops, let them do it. Some were captured. At least 150 refugees were captured and sent back into enslavement. Emma and Edward Whitehurst were able to flee to the safety of Fortress Monroe in time, along with thousands of other refugees. But the threat of Confederate capture was very real wherever refugees stayed with the Federal Army. So-called contraband people were in a legal limbo in terms of their status. Other than Fremont's short-lived order declaring contraband slaves free men, none of the other orders or acts, like the Confiscation Act, addressed their free or slave status. Refugees like Emma and Edward were not really slaves anymore, but weren't entirely free either. Their status was made even more murky, well, Edwards was at least, by another law passed by Congress in July 1862. This law, called the Second Confiscation and Militia Act, brought in the First Confiscation Act by allowing the Union Army to take any and all personal property from rebellious persons. I'm going to pause just to say they are separate acts. It's the Second Confiscation Act and the Militia Act, but they're like signed into law on the same day, and so they just often get lumped together. I just wanted to clarify that. Actually, the law as written stated that any person, quote, committing the crime of treason, end quote, could be fined, imprisoned, or executed, and their slaves set free. Lincoln wasn't nuts about this act either, but after some haggling, eventually signed it too. But along with the Second Confiscation Act also came the Militia Act, which authorized the U.S. military to use black men in the service of the military for manual labor, camp service, and as soldiers. In exchange for this service, black men, here we're mostly talking about contraband refugees, uh, and their immediate families were rewarded with freedom. This seems like a real step in the right direction, right? This law eventually leads to the creation of the first black troops, like the famed 54th Massachusetts, and later the creation of the United States Colored Troops. Now, we talked about the black military experience during the Civil War in our episode on black Union soldiers, so I'm not going to go into that whole story here. So if you're interested in that, you know, please go look there. 
Um, And even better, actually, it seems, in that same time period, in January 1863, Lincoln issued the full Emancipation Proclamation, which freed all enslaved persons in the states in active rebellion. And one of the dominant theories of Black military service is that it was a transformative experience, making former slaves into potential citizens. As one famous quote from a Black soldier goes, I's a man now. And the Emancipation Proclamation, that story goes, brought about the Day of Jubilee, the longed for, fought for, bled for day when slavery died. But while it seems like a step in the right direction, and indeed maybe the end of the story of slavery and emancipation, the lived experience of refugees was still complicated and often tragic. Of course, right? (laughs) Nothing can be simple. So I want us to actually finish today with a story about one refugee family, just to give you an idea of what this all could look like. Outside of Lexington, Kentucky, there is a Union fort called Fort Nelson. By 1864, 500 slaves had poured into the fort, establishing a contraband camp. Many of the refugees at Fort Nelson were people with freed status from Tennessee. By virtue of their bondage in a Confederate state after the Emancipation Proclamation, Tennessee slaves were technically free. But many others at Fort Nelson were from Kentucky. And because they happened to be held in a border state, their status was ambiguous. Sort of contraband, sort of slave, definitely not free. One refugee family with this ambiguous status that sought freedom at Fort Nelson, November 1864, was the Miller family. Joseph Miller, his wife, and four children. By the time they arrived at the fort, Miller's seven-year-old son was ill, likely from exposure on the cold, wet trek to freedom. The Union Army officials processing incoming refugees allowed the family to enter the safety of the fort, but on one condition. Joseph Miller had to enlist in the Union Army. In exchange, they said they would provide safety, shelter, and food to his family. Of course, Joseph Miller agreed to the bargain and became a U.S. soldier. And, as we just learned in the Second Confiscation Act, the families of black soldiers were to be rewarded with freedom, right? This complicates the story we've heard so far. Nowhere in the Confiscation or Militia Act did it say that contraband, quote-unquote contraband, had to perform labor in exchange for protection, especially not service in the military. Miller was effectively pressed into service in exchange for his family's care. They didn't say, under the Confiscation Act, if you enlist in the Army, we'll free your family. They say, the only way we'll let you in this gate is if you enlist in the military and then will give your sick son some place to sleep and some food, right? Mm -hmm. It's different. And while it wasn't uncommon for armies or governments to offer protection for a soldier's family when he enlisted and went off to war, I mean, this was a major promise extended, say, to Confederate soldiers, for instance. These circumstances were vastly different. Miller's family was standing in the cold and the rain outside a fort in a slave-holding territory. If the army didn't take them in, they faced extreme danger. Nonetheless, this arrangement must have been a sigh of relief for the Miller family. Yes, Joseph would have to join the army, which was scary and dangerous, but it could also be a huge moment where he could assert himself as a man and not as a slave, right? And the family would have some place to go, food to eat, shelter from the November weather, maybe even military medical care. But it wasn't long at all before the Union officials at Fort Nelson went back on their promise to Joseph Miller and the other black soldiers pressed into service. Brigadier General Speed S. Pry, commanding the fort, ordered his white soldiers to forcibly evict all the refugees except the men who had joined the army from the fort. The soldiers began the evictions in the middle of the night in late November. So they've only been there for, you know, a a few days or a couple of weeks. Um, And they they order them to do this while all the freed people are sleeping or contraband are sleeping or refugees or however you want to phrase it. Uh, Panic and confusion set in as many of the freed people mistook the Union soldiers breaking down their tents and screaming orders for attacking Confederates. So, like, you know, people are, are, are terrified. The white soldiers forced the refugees out in the middle of a cold, rainy night with only the clothes and supplies they could carry on their backs. Among the families evicted was the family of Joseph Miller, who had only had a handful of days of freedom at the fort. 
Miller was horrified that the army that he had just joined was demanding his family leave. His son was still sick, and surely sending him out into the elements would spell disaster. Miller later recalled of the experience, quote, I told the man in charge of the guard that it would be the death of my boy. I told him that my wife and children had no place to go. I told him that I was a soldier of the United States, end quote. The guard had no sympathy, quite the opposite. He told Miller that if his family didn't evacuate the tent and get on the wagon removing freed people from the fort, he would shoot every last one of them. Miller had no choice but to watch as his wife and four children, all between four and ten, got onto a wagon, headed out of the safety of the fort, and back out into the danger of slaveholding Kentucky. Later, Joseph Miller was able to leave Fort Nelson and venture out in search of his family, who he finally found six miles away, packed into an old boarding house run by free people. His wife and three of their children were huddled in the corner of a room, freezing and hungry. He soon learned that a seven-year-old son, the one who had already been sick, died on the trip to the boarding house, sitting in an open wagon in the freezing rain. But as a soldier, under orders from his officers, he couldn't stay with his family. He had to return to Fort Nelson. The next morning, Miller again walked back to the boarding house, dug a grave for his son, and then returned again to Fort Nelson, unable to even ensure that his wife and remaining children would have access to food or even adequate heat. That In that boarding house, they're all kind of, there's one fireplace, and so everyone's sort of jockeying for positions around the fireplace. And consider that in about 48 hours, Joseph Miller had walked something like 18 miles in cold, wet weather learned of his son's death, dug his son's grave, and buried him. Now, what comes next shouldn't be much of a surprise. Within a couple of weeks, Miller's wife Isabella and his son Joseph Jr. also died. Ten days after that, his daughter Maria died. Finally, his son Calvin died. And just five days after that, Joseph Miller himself died within the safe confines of Fort Nelson. I'm going to read directly from Jim Downs' account of the Miller family here. The Miller family did not die from complicated medical ailments or unknown diseases. They died because they did not have basic necessities. The environment that Isabella Miller and her children were forced to live in made them vulnerable to illness, which was only compounded by their nebulous political status. They were no longer enslaved, but they were unable to be independently mobile and make their own choices. They were refugees forced to live in unhealthy environments. During the war years, the military did not create a policy that responded to their medical needs or a program that provided them with resources. The only support promised was not realized. The Miller family did not experience liberation from chattel slavery as a jubilee, but rather as a continuous process of displacement, deprivation, and ultimately death. This is not the story of emancipation we typically hear. This is no day of jubilo. Enslaved people knew that the war was their opportunity for freedom. They saw the blue uniforms of Union soldiers, the very soldiers who sometimes sang about John Brown's body as they marched, as their saviors. They voted with their feet, claiming freedom for themselves by leaving plantations and going to that army of saviors. In return, though, those people were labeled contraband of war, rewarded with a kind of purgatory status in which they weren't quite free and weren't quite slave. And while some, like Emma and Edward Whitehurst, made it out of this uncomfortable status to start their lives as freed people and citizens of the United States, others, like the Millers, and many thousands more like them, were neglected, starved, and left to the mercies of exposure and disease. And many, many, many refugees found not freedom, but suffering, loss, and death. One thing that that I feel a little bad about. I mean, this is a, a huge topic. It's a huge topic. It's especially a huge topic right now in Civil War historiography. Lots of people are publishing books, like I mentioned, Amy Morrell Taylor's new book on this. David Silkenat recently wrote a book on kind of the the Civil War as a refugee crisis. Um, so this is very much in the in the air of Civil War work right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the problems with that, I mean, that's not a problem. That's great. One of the problems with that for a episode of this show is that I can't fit everything in. And one of the things that unfortunately got short shrift was work on women who were labeled contraband because their status is even more complicated, right? Because they can't always provide the most useful manual labor for the army, 
although they are sometimes cooks and laundresses and things like that. But a lot of times the Union Army, when they see them coming, I was like, oh, yeah, it's more of a burden. It's more of a burden than anything else. So with the elderly, right. Right. Yeah. And so if you're interested in that, I I highly recommend Thavolia Glimpf's work on on contraband women. She has a chapter. I can't think of what the name of the book is that it's in. It's in an edited volume. But she has a chapter called This Species of Property, which is about women contraband. Um, It's very good. It's a very good kind of um, quick sort of recap of their experience. Yeah. So it plays into the question of what the war was really for. And the answer to that is that it was about slavery, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that doesn't mean that the people who were fighting for emancipation, like, weren't racists or something, right? right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, even absolutely. Lincoln, when he tries to talk about his view on... Because after the Lincoln-Douglas debates, people were like, oh, he's, a, he's an abolitionist exactly, a-hole, right? right? So he was trying to, like, moderate a little bit. And yeah. he was like... He said something like, it's not like I want to marry them. Yeah. Like, about yeah. women. Just because I want to, whatever. Just because I think they should be free doesn't mean doesn't I want to marry I them. Marry one. I should right. just be able to leave her alone. Exactly. Right. Like, right. so, like, let's be clear that it's not like they welcomed these escaped slaves with open arms and were like, let us provide you with services and freedom. It right. wasn't like that. It was yeah. like. This is our mission as an army. Not right. at all. Right. Like, some people probably felt that yes. way. Especially, like, Quakers and stuff. People who yeah. had, like, been abolitionists for a long time. Right. Some people probably felt that way. Right. But most people were trying to preserve the Union and fight for the idea of freedom but not necessarily didn't carry over to how they treated the people. You know right. what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and even among some of the abolitionists who become soldiers and officers, even they are like, let's end slavery, but let's make it clear you are not the same as me. Right. Right. Like, and you are sh- still and inferior like, to me. Like, you should not yeah. be mixing. Correct. And, like, we right. should Absolutely. be able to live alongside each other, but not actually, yeah. like, bone and be yeah. the same. Yeah. And then there were people who were, you know, wanted to be very outspoken about the fact that they didn't consider them abolition themselves abolitionists, but were some of the people who were the most um, pioneering in terms of how they actually treated people in real life. You know, like they wouldn't have considered themselves politically like zealous anti-slavery right. advocates or something. But when it comes down to it, they're the ones that sometimes treat slaves or formerly enslaved people the, the best. best. And right. like, I'm thinking of, um, Oh, God, now I can't think of his name. Hold on one second. Let me look him up. You also see something like that in Britain through the abolitionist cause. Like, abolitionists who were the most outspoken in Parliament and who were the most visible, like, appearing mm-hmm. in the newspapers every day, mm-hmm. they were almost never the people who actually treated black Britons the best. Right. Or, yeah. like, there was a... Um, when Sarah Bartman, who we talked about in the eugenics episode, right. she when she went to Britain, there was a court case over her about whether or not she was a slave. Mm-hmm. And, oh my gosh, we might have a slave on British soil, which was against the law at the time. Uh-huh. And was brought by an abolitionist. But he did not give any shits about her. And he mm-hmm. met her and she tried to talk to him. And he was like, um, no thanks, let me talk to your owner. Right, right. And then the owner... Even though politically... Right. This person was an abolitionist. Exactly. And the crazy thing is, in the court case, he made it seem like the owner was this, like, fancy Dutch Boer white guy. Mm-hmm. The owner was also a person of color. Mm. So it was a very, um, it's just very, they, they had these, like, white knights, but, you know, it was more about principle than about mm-hmm. actual people. Right. Like, he didn't treat this actual person who he was, like, supposedly trying to save, right? Right. Didn't treat her with any dignity at all or even talk to her or give a shit what she wanted. Right, right, yeah. Um, so it just kind of reminds me yeah. of that. Whereas her owner, who was actually participating in this horrible um, uh, racial slavery, mm-hmm was actually himself a person of color and his ancestors had been slaves. Mm-hmm. And he treated her very well and she wanted him to come with her when mm-hmm. she went. So right. it's like, it's we're not used <clears throat> to thinking of things in a fuzzy way like yeah. that. Yeah. It, and what I was thinking is, like, some of the the officers that become commanders of units in the United States colored troops were abolitionists who were like, this is my chance. Like, this is my big shot. You know, this is what I've been working for for a long time. 
and then found themselves in positions of power over black men who they believed were inferior and kind of were like, listen, guys, you got you. You need to prove that you aren't inferior. You need to use this as a moment to, like, prove yourselves. Right. Because we all sort of know that you're kind of inferior. Right. You know, so they were kind of this weird mixed messaging. But then other people, the person I couldn't think of his name, it was um, Robert Gould Shaw, who was the commander of the, the 54th, 54th Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay, yeah. And he's like, his parents are abolitionists. And he's kind of like ambivalent about it. He's like, Meh. he didn't really want to take on the 54th. He's like, you know, kind of um, not super into it. And then, and he wasn't always the greatest guy. I'm not saying that he was like some sort of wonderful savior or something. But like when the rubber hit the road, he stood with his men. Um, like there was a pay dispute. They, the, the soldiers hadn't been paid in forever. Uh, and then when they finally got their paychecks, it they were being paid. They found out they were being paid less than white soldiers. And so they wanted to stage a protest and rip up their paychecks and not accept pay. Um, and Robert Gould Shaw, this is a famous moment in the movie Glory. Robert Gould Shaw kind of stands up and at first he's like, you guys need to calm down because it's the chaos is reminding people of slave insurrections, like all these unruly black men with guns. Right. And then he kind of like thinks about it again. And then Shaw rips up his own paycheck. And he's like, as long as you aren't being paid equally, I won't be paid either. He, you know, there's this moment of solidarity with these people, you know. And so it's just, it's interesting to me how complicated this all is, right? Like it's, and that's hard for people today to, I think, swallow. Like we, like the Lincoln thing, right? Yeah. And like it's, we I want think... Lincoln to be like the great emancipator. But it was, it, his actual record is a lot more complicated than that, you know? Yeah. A lot more ambiguous. Right. And I think part of the reason that we think of it as black and white is because we did and still do in many ways have such a defined color line. Mm -hmm. Like as opposed to somewhere like Brazil or Mm -hmm. places in Mesoamerica Mm -hmm. or in uh, South Africa where slavery existed and it was racial slavery Mm -hmm. and it was horrible. Mm -hmm. There also wasn't just black and white. There was, like, way more mixing and, like, um, way more, like, being manumitted and then becoming a slave owner yourself kind of thing. It was, like, more... Things that were very rare in the United States. Right. Um, You know, and then the only thing I can think of where we kind of encountered this in American history is... Um, all the Chickasaw and Choctaws that, like, owed own yeah. slaves, uh-huh. right? Or maybe in um, in New Orleans. Okay, yeah. Where there are, like, the right. gens de couleur and, like, the, yes. you know. Mm-hmm. And and you see these, um, a lot of, like, owners, like, manumitting their slaves, like, mm-hmm. when they died and stuff like right. that. One, it was under yeah. French and Spanish control, and that kind of thing, yeah. like, a different race situation there. Right. Because of, as you say, the French and the Spanish and the right. Americans and the British. And it was, like, just totally different right. than it was in other places. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's hard for, because we didn't have, we don't have those various kind of grades in the middle of... Mm-hmm. Of race or of like status, really in relationship to race, we it's like hard for us to think of yeah. it that way. Yeah. So we think of you know there is the white people that were into slaves, there is the abolitionists, right? And then there was all enslaved people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe sometimes you'll think of the free black people. Yeah. And then that's like it, but it's way more complicated than that. Yeah, and I think we also want historical actors to either be heroes or demons. Like, right. They're either heroic figures, or we need to to use the parlance of the day, cancel them, mm-hmm. right? Like, and then they don't count anymore. We can never talk about them again. And, like, Margaret Abraham, Sanger. Yeah, sure. or, like, Thomas Jefferson, right? Like, Thomas Jefferson yeah. is my always go-to example of this. Like, nope, he's horrible, kill him. Like, you know, but I don't, I mean, Lincoln has gone through a, a similar kind of Thomas Jefferson situation where, like, he's gone from being, like, the hero right like i think of have you ever seen the movie holiday inn no it's like the weird first version of the movie white christmas like they got it wrong and so they did it again and it was white christmas but in the movie holiday inn the whole idea is like we are an inn and we only have shows on holidays and so in vermont in vermont actually it's not it's in connecticut um white christmas is in vermont because vermont is better is more Vermonty, so they fixed that. It's more Christmassy. The first one's in Connecticut, but anyway, because there are only so many holidays, they celebrate all these holidays that you would never be like, "Let's go out to dinner for President's Day," but they do in the movie, and so they have this whole horrible 
scene that's about Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And it's all about Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, right? And it's somebody's dressed up as Abraham Lincoln. And then, well, he's sort of dressed up as Abraham Lincoln. And then everybody else is in blackface. Literally everybody else is in blackface. And there's one scene where they cut to the black uh, cook, who's actually black, not wearing blackface, and her two children who are dressed to look like the pickaninny stereotype. Mm -hmm. And she sings a lyric of the song to her kids where she, like, the kids are like, it's indicated that they don't understand who Abraham Lincoln is. And she sings this part where she's like, it was him who set us darkies free. And it's like, whoa. (laughs) But that's how we think about Abraham Lincoln is like, had nothing to do with them. It was Lincoln did it all. And so when you look at it, the way that Lincoln actually thought about this stuff, it looks like he was actually the devil in it. He was like very far removed. He was very yeah. not the, he, he's the opposite of the great emancipator. And so the instinct is like, we got to ditch him. Like we got to cancel him. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I don't mean to defend Lincoln's actions. Right. But at the same time, it's so complicated, right? He had, he had a mindset. He had an idea about what he wanted to do and it had to be orchestrated. Just, it was like a chess game, mm-hmm. right? And Fremont and Butler were like f***ing that up, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. If and weirdly, that... Fremont and Butler, Butler were Democrats. Right. Which is like so weird. It is weird. That's like what it makes it so like right now our yeah. politics are so, so, so tribal and right. you can't like, you know, we're like stereotyping everyone. Mm-hmm. Like every single like middle-aged white guy, we're like, mm-hmm. oh, it's a f***ing boomer Trumper or whatever. Like, you know, it's. Right. It's yeah. it's easy to like be very polarized, and also but that that's a good reminder. And also that a Democrat today couldn't say um, suddenly become really pro war with Iran. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you can't have like a Democrat with one Republican talking point, or vice versa. Do you know what I mean? Right. Because that means like you're no longer a Democrat, and we can never yeah. talk to you again. That's or because vice versa. of the congressional reforms of the 1970s. Let me just tell you, I've learned a lot about them <laughs> recently, and they ruined our entire world. Right. Well, but either way, it's it's another example of how politics of the 19th century, as you know, because of that partly, but like politics of the 19th century isn't the same as today, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there, you have these, like, northern Democrats who are like, I have an idea. Let's screw over the Confederacy by freeing slaves. Like, let's right. do this Republican thing of freeing slaves. Right. And then Republicans are like, calm down. Right. But yeah. then other Republicans are like, no, they're doing it right. We Like, Lincoln's, Lincoln's the one screwing us over. And so it's very strange. there's strife within the Republican Party. Yeah, it's it's really, really complicated. So if anything, if you walk away with anything from this episode, it's just that this, this, the story of emancipation and freedom is not the straightforward one that you think it is. It is way more complicated. It's unfortunately way more sad than, than we often believe. Right. And that a lot of the, the actual hard work that achieved emancipation was done by, by enslaved people, by enslaved people themselves. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Who like took a ridiculous chance leaving the lives that they knew to go somewhere where they had no idea how they would be received. Right. Right. Um, and it's, and when people like Lincoln, were saying, oh, no, 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 this war is not actually about slavery. We're just trying to save the Union. Right. It was the enslaved people who said, no, this is going to be about slavery. They f- they forced the issue. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. And, but I think maybe, maybe that was in some ways planned. Like, yeah. may, not on mass or anything, but mm-hmm. like, I'm sure that there were some enslaved Absolutely. people who yeah. heard, you know, who knew that Lincoln said, well, it's, who, that Lincoln's, Philosophy was that it has to be it has to be all one or all the other. Yeah. It can't be a little bit of both. And, they, they and so were they were like, it's going to be all that one. And exactly. Then... <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, we went really long again. Sorry. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> no, I think both of us had topics that were extremely complicated and and couldn't be jammed into short episodes. So, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for everything yeah okay thanks for everything <laughs> hopefully for everything. hopefully that was a worthwhile redo of that contraband episode it's always haunted me because it's a really great uh topic and you know now hopefully we have a one that's better sound quality and more detail or whatever yeah i'm excited that we did it again <laughs>
Nice. Okay. Right. So um, leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Um, ask to join our Dig History Pod Squad on yes. Facebook and follow us on Facebook and um, Twitter, Dig underscore History. You can also email us at hello, hello. at digpodcast.org. Yep. Okay. We love you. We did it. All right. Yeah. We love you. Goodbye. The The Irwin. <laughs> Irwin McD- it's not the Irwin. It's Irwin Irvin. Mc- <laughs> the Irwin McDowell. Okay. I don't know why you keep calling it Irwin. <laughs> Irvin McDowell and his Union forces. What the f*** is wrong with me? I was like on drugs when I wrote this. <laughs> Kansas. To Kansas. <laughs> Kansas. 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 Okay. Had already succeeded. <laughs> Seceded. <laughs> I, I'm just, I don't know why I said that. Reimburse slave old honers. Honer. <laughs> <laughs> Slave owners. Okay, sorry. I'm having a Marissa problem where I can't breathe all of a sudden. <laughs> so he set up his quarters in St. Louis. His headquarters. That's what I said. You said quarters. I did? Yes. With which nothing but the clothes with. There's two widths. Yeah, okay, okay. With. Nothing. With. <laughs> <laughs> And if any one of them failed to survive a Kurt challenge, court, court challenge. a Kurt, a Kurt This was cha- looking at my book and typing <laughs> it out. Just as Tani's decision in Dreads. It's Tani? It's Tawny. It's Tawny. Yeah. That's not how you spell Tani. This law eventually leads. <coughs> right. <laughs> actually, the law was written. Well, actually. <laughs> so hang on. Days. You're canceled. Sorry, sorry. Very strange looking fella. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Historian Alan Guelzo. Gelzo. Gelzo. Guelzo. I spelled here wrong. This is. Now you were a college graduate. <laughs> I'm just kidding. John C. Fremont. Free... Is it Fremont? Fremont. Well, why is there an E accent a goo in there? I, I don't know. It's just how it's spelled. Then it would be Fremont. It's, I've, it would be Fremont. Fremont. Well, it's always spelled like that, but I've always heard it pronounced Fremont. Yeah, because, right. We're, like because America. Be, du Bois should be Dubois. Yeah, says, I know. It really doesn't. Oh, know. and she Dubois. it up with When I web. said Dubois, this bitch over here was like, um, oh my god. Are you sad? <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, it shouldn't be. It's clearly Dubois. Yeah, okay, well, sorry. you just get to do that to her when she does European episodes with you. And she's like, oh my god, I didn't know that. And you can yes. be like, that's Dubois. why, that's like when my, my, like, I'm able to, like, finally throw it back at you, Europeans. <laughs> 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 this is America. It's not how we talk. <laughs> um, okay, so. Don't waste their <laughs> It's just one of my favorite, like, terms. I just, like, love it. Because I, like, you can imagine just, just like, meh. Stephen Douglas. <laughs> like you can just picture like a dorky, like slightly overweight, like mm-hmm. a hole. <laughs> just like which is and they obviously tend to be kind of funky looking. Like yeah, James like Buchanan. real like large headed, and I don't know the idea of a doe faced Democrat. Right, right, right. Seems. Mm-hmm.